Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. There you go, and welcome to Let's Talk Native. I'm John Kane. I'm your host. And let me start by just reading a post that I put up on Facebook and I sent out to a few people. Um, it'll be pretty self-explanatory. And then let me explain a little bit more about it. So here goes. So last night, I participated in the CCS Restorative Justice Healing Circle exercise. This was part of... Uh, there was a part where the participants were asked to offer their account of their favorite safe space. I heard two board members talk about some references to their vast land holdings and how safe it was for them. Now, it may not have been their intent to characterize it that way, but it's what I heard. I spoke about the space I use in Brooklyn for my live events. Those Live events were film screenings uh, with Q&As, speaking events. Uh, I brought in performers. At one event, I showed the film The Dakota 38. And I've talked about The Dakota 38 on this program quite a bit. Um, but And this film was about uh, native horseback riders um, who made the ride retracing the ride of those who were hanged in Mankato, Minnesota in uh, December of 1862. The wintertime ride was brutal and they were helped along the way by um, several non-native ranchers and landowners. The film featured a young man, Billy Ray Dumark. He was only 19, but made this tough ride, but it wasn't just the ride that he struggled with. He didn't know how to take the whole white folk thing. <laughs> Billy Ray came from a tough life of poverty and despair on one of the more destitute native territories. The non-native filmmaker couldn't understand why the writers weren't more appreciative of the help and support they got from these affluent white folks. Through the film, Billy Ray lightened up a little bit. His spirits seemed to lift. And he talked about what this ride had come to mean to him and how he looked forward to next year. But at the end of the film, in the credits, they listed in memory of Billy Ray Dumark. He had committed suicide before the next ride would, would occur. See, all I could think about was what it must be, what it must have been like for these impoverished, beaten down, yet proud native men on this ride through lands that were once theirs. And wrestling with how to feel about these affluent white people living great lives off of their homelands that they no longer live on. Even their generos generosity had to sting a little bit. Even for Billy Ray Dumark. Especially after the ride when Billy Ray went home. The Brooklyn Commons, where I held my events, was my safe space where I could completely break down in front of a crowded room of strangers, essentially, telling the story of Billy Ray Dumark. Hearing the two board members talk, uh, talk one talking about her great farm, with a name, a native name, by the way, and the public speaking she does to uh, debunk or bust the stereotypes about how farmers are viewed, and the other speaking of his family's 150 acres in the lower Adirondacks, all former native lands. As we went through this exercise to heal the community over the mascot debate, made me think of Billy Ray and perhaps less about my safe space to tell his story, but more about Billy Ray. 
I was the only one in that room with any Native ancestral connections to that area. So that's a post. I just I, I wrote it um, today and posted it on Facebook and sent it out to a few people. I wasn't participating much in this in this healing circle. But when I heard the two board members talk about what their safe space was, they're, they're, again, they're, they're sprawling land holdings. All I could think was that that used to be native land. And that that area that is now theirs isn't my safe space. My safe space it, it, it was a cafe in Brooklyn where I educated non-native people about native issues. Now, I'm not a guy who, who clings to have safe spaces to, uh, you know, to, you know, become reclusive in and, or to rehabilitate myself or rejuvenate myself. It's that, I'm not that kind of person. But thinking about a, a safe space, you know, a teaching and talking and doing public speaking is, is one, of my, um, one of my safe spaces, I guess. And, I, and I'm comfortable doing it. But listening to two board members talk about their their, their sprawling land holdings, you know, again, it, it went back to non-native people not understanding what native people must experience when we are surrounded by the affluence that has basically come at our expense. And I know people say, well, we didn't take the land. Yeah, I know we, we hear that all the time. But here's one of the ironies, additional ironies of last night. So this, this idea, this concept of restorative justice and healing is about trying to figure out what everybody's feeling, you know, and, and you're supposed to feel safe about doing it. Well, there was trouble with some of the safety in the event last night because there were some pretty angry people there. And I don't think there's anything wrong with what I was hearing evoking something that, um, you know, that I had an emotional response to um, because I wasn't lashing out. I wasn't lashing out to board members. I wasn't lashing out to anybody. I was just kind of talking about being able to talk about this stuff. But there were people there who were, who were just flat out angry and not just angry about this process that was being employed but angry about who was going to be allowed to participate or, or who needed to participate. The one, one of the guys was, was speaking about how uh, he was expressing his anger that there wasn't, weren't more teachers. And he said, the teachers in this community and the people in that schoolhouse are the real leaders in this community and they should be here. And if they aren't here, that's totally unacceptable. I mean, he, he said everything, but damn it, <laughs> as he was expressing his anger that there wasn't there, that there weren't enough um, school personnel involved in the, uh, you know, in, in the whole process. Um, now somebody else, and ironically, as, as some of you may know, as I have been engaged in this mascot debate in, this is my hometown, by the way, this is the school that I graduated from. So as I've been engaged in some of this, this debate, part of my part of this ends up being about me um, having to deal with a native family, a family that I know very well that lives in the area that is in favor of the mascot. And what I heard last night from members of that family was their curiosity and how this process would narrow down uh, to exclude people like me. When does this process only come back to the to the people who are part of this community and why, and eliminate the outsiders. And I'm paraphrasing, but that came from one of the native guys. Now, again, I'm Mohawk. That area of eastern New York, that that territory, that area was occupied by Mohawks at, at, at one time. It it was probably occupied by. Um, by Mohicans and maybe Hurons and Lenape. There may be, you know, a convergence of Native people who at various, at various times had lived there. But the Native family who lives there now, for one thing, the, uh, 
the guys who spoke at this thing last night, they're not actually considered enrolled members of the Onondaga Nation because their father's Onondaga. But they, they have no connection to the to Onondaga Nation. They've never, frankly, I don't know if they've even ever been there. They've lived in, in, in Cambridge their whole life. And so they're not considered, quote unquote, enrolled members. And I hate to, you know, characterize it that way, but, but that's just the fact. Um, but that's not ancestral Onondaga territory. So the fact is that the native family, just because they, they support the mascot and, and I oppose it, we're literally calling for somebody they know and they've known for many, many years who is also native and whose ancestry is more connected to the area. They're calling for me to be eliminated from the conversation. You know, so, and this is, to me, this ends up being less about the mascot and more about our relationship to, to area and, and, and place. And that's what I, I picked up out of, you know, I don't know that I feel any more healed <laughs> after going through that experience last night with this, uh, with this restorative justice um, um, healing circle. In fact, I think some things were evoked in much the same way that those riders from the Dakota 38 film, Billy, J., uh, Billy Ray Dumark, just like some of those tensions were evoked in them. I couldn't help feel as the only person in that Zoom room <laughs> that had any ancestral connection to that land, but it was, but, and that it was only ancestral because I'm now being made to feel unwelcome there in my own ancestral lands. Even as the school calls themselves Indians. Look, I went to school there from third grade till I graduated. I know many of the family names that are out there, the ones who, who are engaged in this debate right now. And I'm not saying that I'm totally unwelcome. Look, there, there's, I, I do have some solid friends back there. And there's you know, some of the older families that I, I've had relationships with that I, I still can go see. But I also have an awful lot of my old friends, classmates, if you will who are completely hands off on this, on, on this mascot debate. Why? Well, part of it is they're afraid of backlash. They're afraid about how they're going to be viewed by other elements of, of the community. And, and some, of the, some of that community can be, can be really nasty and angry. And, and I'm seeing some of that. I'm, I'm you know, receiving some of that vitriol from those people who are just really hating on me. I'm, I'm not real popular there. I'm popular amongst a few people, but I'm not real popular back there. And the thing about this, you know, this ongoing debate about mascots is it ends up being less about the mascot and more like this, this almost a sense of, um, I don't know, um, it's not even nationalism. What do you, what do you call it when, when people are so against outsiders coming in, um, yeah, xenophobia. Yeah, more more like xenophobia, <laughs> because the the idea that some of these folks are are this angry at a voice from somebody who is from that community. I you know I lived there, like I said, a good a good part of my young life. But to be that xenophobic to say we don't want that voice here. We don't care if he used to be here. We don't care if he's native. We don't care if he's of native ancestry that that is somehow uh, uh, indigenous to the area. We don't, want to, we don't want to hear what he has to say. And that coming from native voices. Well, loosely defined as native voices. It's, it's, it's incredible. And, and, and again, when I realized that, that Billy Ray Dumark had, uh, had taken his own life, and I, the first time I screened the film, I didn't know it. It wasn't until the second time, because when I first saw the in memory of Billy Ray Dumark at the end of the film, I had to find out why. And so yeah, I got back from New York and I started looking it up online and, and I found, uh, I found the accounts and, um, you know, and, and it really tore me up. It tore me up even as I was researching it, because when I watched the film and, and look, and if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to find it. I don't, 
I can't recommend it right now. I'll, if I maybe I'll post a link if I can find the link to it. <clears throat> but as I watched the film, I was drawn to Billy Ray because I could see the tension that that existed with him. He talked about, and and some of others talked about how rough their lives were back home, wherever home was. And you know, I don't and I don't remember which specific uh, territory uh, Billy Ray was from, but. You know, it goes it goes along the lo- same lines as some of the things we've talked about on the show. The, the the you know the policy imposed poverty that exists on some of these native territories. The the lack of hope or prospect for the future. I mean, the, the immediate question when when somebody commits suicide is, well, why did they do that? Well, there's a there's a laundry list of reasons that suicide is uh, as prevalent as it is on native territories. You know, and and as you watch Billy Ray in this in this film, struggling with this relationship between he as a writer on this on this thing, I mean, again retracing the ride that the those men would who were, who were going to be hanged in Mankato, Minnesota, the largest mass execution in the history of the United States, signed off by Abraham Lincoln, as he's as he's you know reenacting almost this ride through the through the brutal brutal weather think about this minnesota i mean this is this is not exactly uh you know tropical weather up there as they're as as they are reenacting this ride and 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 actually doing this ride and then being forced to rely on the generosity of the people who now own all the land and not just own it. They they own it, and uh, you know they they put out a big spread, and they offered them place to stay, and they 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 helped them with their you know uh, with their animals, and and you know they hate them. They did all the all the stuff, and because they could, because all these white people were living really really good lives, and. These riders got to experience, if only for a moment, the good life that those people have on their homelands. But then when the ride's over, you go home. And I just wonder how much, how much of that ride ate at Billy Ray afterwards. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not even saying that it was necessarily. I, I have no. I'll have no way of knowing that the ride had anything to do with his suicide, but it sure didn't prevent one. Even though through the course of the filming of this of, of this ride, you could see Billy Ray's you know demeanor change. You know this this ride and the and the prospect of doing another one the next year wasn't enough to help him survive the year so i mean so now i i put myself in a, in a different spot but with some similarities as i go back to my hometown cambridge new york where i graduated from high school where i still have some like i said i still have some friends no no family out there anymore but i still have some friends out there and some of those friends genuinely support my push to, to have the mascot my removed. But, but, the, but that, but just that idea that there's no native people there. And the only one family that is, is there is a family that's not, you know, doesn't, ha- isn't indigenous in terms of their n- native affiliation to the area, but there's no native people there, but you have white people who will name their farm after a native word. And of course, there are landmarks, there are, are rivers and, and creeks and, and townships and, you know, landmarks that, that bear some of the native names. And then there's the schools. 95% white population, 99% non-native population, um, calling themselves Indians. And there's a reason to call themselves Indians. Because they don't really even know who are the native people from the area? They don't know. Is it Mohawk? Is it Lenape? Is it Mohican? Is it, is it um, you know, Huron? You know, we don't know. And they don't care to know. 
Now we're just going to characterize it as this, this and, and literally the pan Indian word for in, for native people, which is Indian. And that way, when a family like the Hanyosts <laughs> who live there, they can more identify with the mascot, even though, again, they're not, they're not, in, they're, they're not indigenous to, you know, they're, they're Onondaga or they're Onondaga affiliated. So they don't have, you know, the ancestry indigenous to the area. And again, although I do, <laughs> they've made it their home. And, it, and it's, it's, it's white. I mean, it's, it's a white community. I mean, there's, there's almost no other way to describe it. And it's not just white. It's white and right. I mean, and I mean right wing, not right as in right and wrong. <laughs> I mean, the amount of Trump flags that, high, that fly in the area. I mean, they're, they're, it's a Republican congressman for, that represents the area. Um, you know, some of the, the political ideology that is spelled out, you know, by, by many of the people there. And I'm not saying there, there's no, you know, progressive people in the air there certainly are and and i and i let me i want to take the opportunity to to thank the um uh cambridge for social justice group that's out there who has been very supportive um some of the work that i've been trying to do to uh to not only get rid of the the native mascot but in, in fact the cambridge for social justice is sponsoring and and putting on a um, um a walk uh, tomorrow in honor of uh, missing and murdered indigenous women. And, and they've got a huge, you know, they've got a big turnout. They've got, they, they've got a whole bunch of people who have registered for it. So they're obviously pretty effective at addressing social justice issues, but they're in a minority out there. And I'm not going to you know say that it's an overwhelming minority, but, but certainly if it's just about squeaky wheels to be a part of that zoom call last night and to hear a kid that I watched, you know, I, I grew up with his father and I, and to hear this kid and I say kid, he's in his thirties, but to hear this young guy, um, in a healing circle environment, expressing his anger, um, in the way that he did, uh, to having outsiders involved in the, uh, in the process, uh, meaning me, uh, it's not about being hurtful, it, it just kind of shows you how far things have gone. And it's, and you know, look, it's hard to be optimistic. You know, I, I had a good life as a, as a young kid growing up in that, in that little village, in, in that area. The school was good. You know, we, we had, uh, you know, we earned a, a, you know, a pretty good ranking in terms of uh, academic accomplishments. You know, we didn't have great sports teams back then, although I will say that, that that's not entirely true. The, the girls were um, had pretty successful sports teams. And frankly, that's kind of the way it is now in Cambridge. And now I think about it. I think the, the football team um, has had a dismal season. They blamed it on COVID. But in the meantime, the, the girls basketball team in, in Cambridge has been, you know, continue to be phenomenally successful. But um, I mean, the, the hallmarks of, of, of Cambridge was really a, a, that it was a caring community and that it was welcoming. I mean, I will say it was never a very diverse town. It certainly wasn't and isn't. Um, I don't, other than me being a native student in my class, and, and we had one other student, I don't know if he was an exchange student, but he was from, he was from Pakistan. But the, we were the only two people of color in my, in, in my entire class. And so it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, by no means did it any represent diversity. And the, the faculty didn't represent diversity. In fact, I don't think there's, there's I don't know if there's any faculty of color in, in Cambridge today. Um, maybe there are, but um, I've, I haven't seen any, and I've been to board meetings and that kind of stuff, and, and I haven't seen any administrators or anybody, anybody else that represented much in the way of diversity. But I will say, it was interesting to hear two board members um, talk about their safe spaces because, and I, and I won't say that it triggered me, but t listening to these two board members talk about their safe spaces being 
and 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 that those spaces were more than spaces. They were places. They were large, sprawling land holdings. Um, and and again, what it evoked in me was not just Billy Ray Dumark's story and the story of those riders riding through their ancestral homelands now occupied by affluent white people and realizing the place that I was in, even as we were doing this, this healing circle, um, that I was different than everybody else in the room, because even with a couple of native people, and I think there were three, um, people in the room and I knew all three of them, uh, uh in the room who were native, the Hanyos family, um, they didn't welcome me there. So not only was I an outsider uh, ethnically, culturally, um, but ideologically. Now, that's not to say that there weren't people support that, that support what I'm doing there. But to be the only native voice, essentially the only native voice in that room, and it's not to say that the, th that the, the three Hanyos don't have native ancestry, but um, they were not speaking in a way that um, th there was no camaraderie between them and them and I. That's for sure. Um, so anyway, uh, I had to I I had to post that today because even as as I um, mentioned the Brooklyn Commons uh, as the venue that I do my live events and explain explained a little bit about presenting the Dakota 38 to, to that crowd. On one hand, I was demonstrating that that was a space that I could talk about something that could um, cause, you know, me to demonstrate my emotion. And that space was safe enough for me to do it, even in front of a crowded room of predominantly strangers. So that was the, the, that conformed to what the um, the ask was of this round of, uh, of you know of offering in this in this circle, but the ulterior motive to me bringing up my safe space was to talk about what was to really put on display how the safe space is offered by two board members evoked this uh, this memory of what Billy Ray Dumark experienced on his ride and post ride um, to commemorate the hanging of the Dakota 38 in Mankato, Minnesota. This is where there's a disconnect because the, the tears that I shed when I was explaining to this crowd to pay attention to Billy Ray Dumark in the film and then offering the explanation on why I asked him to do that afterwards. The tears that, that, I, that I shed were both tears of remorse for Billy Ray Dumark, but they're also tears of frustration that in the absence of Billy Ray Dumark taking his own life, could I have made any of the people in that room understand the intergenerational trauma of, of being displaced from your land. And even now, as I address this little, my old, old hometown, Cambridge, and I talk about the fact that native people don't live there anymore, that, that we've been deprived of our land. And, and in fact, and there are some people who have, again, sprawling land holdings there. We're not there, but they still appropriated our image for, for their mascot so they can entertain themselves with it. So they can put it on their letterhead and then use a word that is so generic and archaic and inappropriate. I'm not saying Indians, the word Indians is, is offensive, but we're not Indians. And we are called Indians for all the wrong reasons. And in fact, there are people from India who legitimately can wear that title as Indians and that nomenclature. But Cambridge still wants to maintain that name 
and that logo and that mascot knowing that we're not there anymore. And the only native people in that town are the ones that have totally conformed to much of the right wing ideology, ideology that, that exists there. So I wanted to tell the story, not just about the mascot battle, but I wanted to remind people about Billy Ray Dumark. He left an impression with me even before I knew of his tragic end. But there's a reason this stuff happens. And those reasons are complex, but they do deserve our attention. And in the absence of giving it any, all we manage to do is show a complete lack of empathy for the struggles that some people go through. Not only because of historical trauma, but even trying to correct false narratives and, and affect change that would be good for all, like removing native mascots. So I'm going to thank you for listening. I'm John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.